Go ahead and look at the screen then. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming, when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed. and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed. And then, I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. And then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. 
Then they asked him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. All right. Quite a... Uh quite a scene, isn't it? I mean, could you imagine being there witnessing all this happen? Could you imagine uh, being that man who was blind and then could see? Like crazy, crazy stuff. And I know that uh, even today, many of us, are, our, our desire is to figure out why things happen, right? Uh, we go through different circumstances and events and times in our lives, and, and we always try to ask that question, Why? Why did God let this happen? Why uh, did this series of events take place? And, and the difficulty with that is sometimes we can start to see that, that answer, where you can kind of see what God is doing and, and how the big picture is working together. I know uh, just this past year, uh, Bree and I were uh, working through some things and, and wrestling with God on something, and we asked the very same question, all right, why? Why did all of this happen? Clearly, it seemed that God had been involved in the situation, and then it seemed that he was leading in a direction, and then he didn't do that. And we were like, okay, what's going on? Why? One of those times that we don't have an answer for that. Uh, there's other times I look back on my life where I've asked that why question, and over time, started to see the fruit of what God was doing. Sometimes those things take a long time. Sometimes they happen in a short span. I think we are built, something inside of us longs to know why. And I think that's an important question. That is the question that we need to keep in mind as we look at this passage, right? If we uh, look at what's happened here and we look at this amazing event, this crazy miracle that Jesus performs, I think that why question is the important one to ask. Now, all the people who witnessed it didn't ask that question. What question were they asking? How? How? You'll, you'll see that throughout the whole passage. Verse 10, uh, you see it with the neighbors and the people who had seen him before as a blind man. How were your eyes open? Verse 15, uh, they asked him how he had received his sight. Verse 19, how does he then now see? Verse 26, why did, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Uh, they wanted to know the how. How, how, how. And lots of people even today are asking the same question when we look at this passage. Lots of people ask the, the how 
I mean, we have the, the basic information. Jesus spit in the ground and made mud and put it on the guy's hands and went and washed in the pool and he could see. How did that work? And we, uh, people have put explanations out there that it must have been something with, the, you know, the combination of the spit and mud. And it was Jesus' spit and, you know, that made the mud special. And is that the point? No. Why? Why? is the question we ought to ask. Right at the beginning, uh, we see this uh, interaction between Jesus and his disciples, and I have to admit that it took me going back and reading the passage a second time to really catch that because of what they ask. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? That's the kind of question we expect the Pharisees to ask, right? The religious leaders. This man's blind. Why? Who sinned? him or his parents. And I think Jesus' response is very telling here. Very telling of what the whole purpose of this is all about. It wasn't that this man sinned, verse 3, or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Why? So that the works of God might be displayed in him. If you are the kind of person who likes to underline or write things in your Bible, underline works. Circle the S on the end of it. I think it's such a significant thing, right? Because we look at this and, and immediately because we've read the story, we're familiar with the story, we know like, okay, uh, this man receives his sight. A, a work of God was done in his life. But Jesus doesn't say so that a work of God would be shown in him, but so that the works of God, plural, significant. It tells us that as we look at this, this miracle that is about to happen before uh, this man's now open eyes and the eyes of everybody else who is going to see is that this miracle, really, it has a deeper meaning to it. This miracle has a much deeper meaning than just the fact that this man receives his sight. Jesus is going to reveal something and, and show something far more significant. The works of God will be displayed in this man. So, here's his disciples, right? Having this conversation with you. Thinking they have some grasp on the circumstance. Some grasp on the situation. And, and what a moment that Jesus takes to really teach them something. And really the people all around. This is an opportunity for them to have this aha moment, if you will. This learning and understanding of what is going on. And so, as we dive into this and look at this miracle, we dive into the deeper meaning of it. We need to stop, and I, I want to recognize that the, the context of this scene, the context of this miracle is absolutely critical to understanding what's going on. The context is so important, right? We have been talking about Jesus for the last, uh, really from chapter 7 in John's Gospel through chapter 8, even now into chapter 9. The context being uh, on the heels or in the midst of this Feast of Tabernacles, right? So in the context of John's gospel, we are tied right back to Jesus' claim at the, in chapter 8, in verse uh, 12. I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. He, he says it again right here in, uh, in verse 5. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. That, that for the reader of the gospel of John, this should connect this. This should bring back to mind, okay, yes, Jesus is the light of the world. Now he's claiming to be the light of the world. He's going to do this miracle that is going to reveal this and reveal what the light of the world does. The context is important in showing this. This isn't just uh, they happen across some random blind guy on the side of the road who is begging, and Jesus is like, oh, let's just heal this man. There was intentionality for this. And so put yourself in the context of this man's life for a second. We don't know exactly how old he was, do we? But he's old enough, he's, he's not with his parents. He's out in the streets begging. And Jesus says that he has lived an entire life being blind for this purpose, that the works of God would be displayed in him. Talk about perspective, huh? 
You ever think he wondered, why me? Why did I get this? Why do I have to live a life of being blind? I can't support myself. I can't work because I can't see. I'm now this social kind of outcast in life. Why me? 15 years of that? 18, 20, 30? I don't know. But so that the works of God would be revealed to him. Don't you think after this, he'd probably say, man, it was all worth it? Maybe. A little bit of perspective. Context in his life. There's also the context of this hope of the Messiah coming. If you were to look back in Isaiah chapter 35, verse 5, it says that then the eyes of the blind, this messianic age when the Messiah comes, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf, deaf unstopped. <laughs> and isn't it kind of ironic that as Isaiah talks about this coming age, when the Messiah will come, this, this age that they are the, the Jewish people, the people of Israel are anticipating, longing for, wanting to see come. For generations, they've looked ahead to this age when the Messiah will come, when the Christ will appear. And now Jesus shows up and opens the eyes of the blind. And what's the response of religious leaders? <laughs> they miss it. Only revealing just how what? blind they must be so you have this context of of all these things taking place and it's super important for us to keep that in mind as we look at this passage as we look at this whole scene unfold because it's within that context within that frame of thinking that worldview that people had or lack thereof that jesus steps in as the light of the world to to open eyes of the blind and so I would, uh, what I want to do is as we work through this passage, I want to highlight a case study in the characters that we see. I'll just uh, take a minute to do that because as we walk through, we, we meet different people, right? So I want to uh, present that perhaps Jesus and the disciples, they show up and they see this blind man. He's case study number one. All right, the blind man, we, we come across him, and I think there's something to learn um, in his response to the light. And again, I, wa I want to just preface this that these people weren't just like Aesop's fables. These people weren't just parables. This was a real-life event. This actually happened. But isn't it, isn't it true that sometimes God uses the real-life scenarios to make things a little bit more real for us? That they don't be, they're not just some theoretical, out-there idea, just some abstract Thing, but he uses a real life situation that uh, we can look back on and say, man, I, I get this now that I didn't understand before because I lived through it. He took me through this. And that's, that's what I mean by these case studies, if you will, that these are real life people, real life events that the people are learning and engaging with this. So first one, the man who was born blind. I want to ask you just for a second to try to put yourself in his shoes you've spent your whole life not able to see and enjoy color looking at another person's face appreciating anything like that the beauty of what we can behold with our eyes none of that this man for the first time ever eyes opened can see it you think his parents ever described for him when he was growing up what a flower looked like how would you describe to a blind person what a flower looks like well the stem's green and it's got this uh, leaf that's like a triangle and then the, the petals on the flower around the, they're, they're bright red what does that mean And here he is for the first time opening his eyes and seeing. Can you just sit back for a second and think, holy cow, even just to experience that, 
How beautiful would the, the landscape of a cornfield look like to a man who's never seen before? Or even a dandelion on the side of the road. Eyes opened for the first time. Remember, there is a deeper meaning here. What happens to this man? His eyes are open. He's walking through the town. And everyone's like, hey, isn't that the guy who was blind? He, he, he was the guy who sat on that corner, right? He was the one I gave change to him yesterday. That's him, right? But yeah, yeah, that's totally him. Other people are like, no, no, it's just somebody looked like him, right? Lookalikes. And there's this debate. And so they ask this guy, what happened to you? I don't know. Some guy put mud on my face. I went and washed in the pool. Now I can see. That's what he's got. So these people are, are interested, and so they... they take and there's more questions more questions more questions he ends up in front of the religious leaders who are asking him the same questions and what does he do he sticks to his story because what he had in his tool belt wasn't some theological prowess it wasn't his formal education that he had all growing up as a matter of fact you know the the pharisees say this man's a sinner and his response to it in verse 25 if you look at that whether he's a sinner i do not know in other words Modern translation, who am I to judge? I, I, I don't have an idea. Maybe he is a sinner, maybe he's not, but this is what I know. I was blind and now I can see. The one thing this man has to stand on is his testimony, his personal experience. I don't know all this. I don't, maybe, I don't know how to make sense of it all, but what I do know is I couldn't see before. This man shows up, puts mud on my eyes. I go wash in this pool and now I can see deeper meaning deeper meaning what happens to this man as a result of his testimony and these things uh, where he stands firm the religious leaders kick him out of the synagogue who does he meet Jesus and Jesus comes up do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus says, you've seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And John records that he then worshipped him. Deeper meaning. This man's physical eyes were opened. But more than that, his spiritual eyes were opened. That he would see the Son of Man, not just physically, but yes, physically, believe in him and worship him. The deeper meaning. This is what it's about. This is the key to the whole thing. The deeper meaning that is not just about physical sight, but it's about spiritual sight. Who is Jesus? He is the light of the world. He is the light of the world. And for some, the light of the world will open their eyes and reveal the truth and they will believe and worship God. The deeper meaning. But then you have other people involved in the same story. We have the blind man that we meet first and then we meet, in verse 8, his neighbors. We got the neighbors and they are those who had seen him before as a beggar, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? It's he. Others know, but it's like him. They kept say, he kept saying, I am the man. So they asked him how, again, asking the wrong question. And what do these people do? Verse 13, they brought this man to the Pharisees. Now, I don't know if you remember, but back uh, earlier when Jesus healed the lame man, there was all this questioning that took place and then the lame man kind of turned Jesus in. You remember that? Yeah, he went back to the religious leaders. It was Jesus. I, I don't think it's the same sense here with the neighbors. It seems like there's a little bit of a genuine curiosity. What are we supposed to do with this? He was the man who was blind. Now he can see. He says it was this Jesus. He doesn't know where he's at. So they bring him to the religious leaders, right? The Pharisees. Now it's interesting because they don't take him to the whole of the Sanhedrin. Okay, the Sanhedrin would have been the ones who were going to make a judicial rule saying, yep, Jesus is out of bounds and wrong. He just takes him to the Pharisees. Still significant. 
But the context of it, the Pharisees are the ones who were leading and organizing the ministry of the local synagogue. So modern context. These people take them to their pastors, if you will. All right, here's the situation. What are we supposed to do with this? Pastors get involved, start asking them questions. The Pharisees are in on this. I think there was some curiosity on the part of the neighbors. But curiosity that didn't end up leading to their eyes being opened to the truth. Aren't there people today who have curiosity about the things of God? Who are curious, how, how do I make sense of all of this? In the church world, uh, uh, we have seen that there are more and more people in view of all this COVID stuff that's happened who have sought out church. Why? What am I supposed to do with this? How do I make sense of all of this? You go through a difficult thing or some crazy circumstance in your life. What am I supposed to do with this? How am I supposed to understand it? And people start asking questions. And they'll seek out answers. And they may go to uh, the church or the pastor or the elders and say, help me, help me try to make sense of all of this. But there's a lot of people who come and then they go. They look for an answer. And maybe they don't like the answer. Maybe it's not what they were looking for. They don't get anywhere with it. And they, and they leave. There's people who spark curiosity and then end up taking the path away. So from there, the Pharisees are asking this man. They don't, they're not happy with him. So they go and they bring in the man's parents, the next group of people, our next case study, if you will. The Jews didn't believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. And they asked him, is this your son? If anyone's going to know, it should be mom and dad, right? So they call in mom and dad, is this your son? Yes, he's, this is our boy, right? Was he born blind? Yes, how does he now see? Don't know. Don't know. Do you think they knew? Do you think they knew? Mm. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. Why did they say that? Because they were afraid. They feared the Jews. And they didn't want to get kicked out of their synagogue. There are people. No who may have an understanding of the truth, an understanding of perhaps who Jesus is. But for fear of the cost of following him, never actually follow. The cost of following Jesus is great. It's a free gift of God, right? Yes, but to follow him costs you everything. How many times throughout Jesus' ministry does he talk about the cost of discipleship? If anyone should come after me, he should die to himself. He who wishes to save his life must lose it. Your love for me should make it look like all the love for other people is like you hate them. The cost of following Jesus is great. And for these people, the fear of losing their social context, for the fear of being kicked out of their religious group was enough that they did not want to publicly affirm who Jesus was. Could you imagine the conversations that mom and dad had around the kitchen table? This man and their son. Mom, dad, I can see. I can see. Wow. Starts, I mean, I don't, for a parent, you got to think that's, that's exciting, right? Your kid who's never been able to see, now you can see, like, this, this is awesome. He leaves, and they're sitting there at the table like, okay, you, you were there too, right? This is real. Our boy can see. He says this Jesus man did it, and, and they sit and have these conversations about who Jesus must be. Is this legit? Is this, you know, okay, well, if Jesus did this, we, we can't go public with this. If we go public with this, we'll get kicked out. We're going to get punished. We'll just let him talk for himself. I don't know. What, what would those conversations have been like? But at the end of the day, they were afraid, fearful of the cost of publicly professing Jesus as Messiah, as Christ. 
Are there those today who are afraid of what it may cost them? I remember as a kid, maybe you can resonate with this, hearing people say, you need to give your whole life to Jesus, not just part of your life. What part of your life are you holding on to? You heard a conversation or teaching like that before. I remember as a kid thinking, yeah, I want to give my whole life to God, but I was scared for a while. What if he calls me to something that I don't want to do? What if he calls me to do something that I'm scared of? He might. He might. Matthew 10, 32 through 33, Jesus says that everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Huge, huge stuff, huh? There are people who will deny Christ before men. Lastly, I want to look at the Pharisees. These people who kind of have it all in front of them, and yet they still openly and publicly deny Christ. They reject Him altogether. And I want to, I want to give them some credibility here. I don't think it's wrong for them to fact-check things. I don't think it's wrong to try to evaluate and say, is this legit? I think we should do that. We should be doing that. You should be doing that with every sermon and lesson and devotional and song that you hear or listen to. Fact check it with the scriptures. Is this legit? When, when Jeremy gets up and preaches on a Sunday morning, it's not just about, did I, did I feel good when I walked away from it? But no, did he teach the truth? Is it true with what the scriptures say? And that's what we ought to do. So on that level, I'm not going to knock the Pharisees. I don't want to knock them for doing their homework, but I think it comes to a point where when you are trying to find any little thing to pin a guy on, that's different. When you are not willing to say, okay, I'm seeing it stack up and and I'm there. But then you're like, I don't want to lose the authority that I have. I don't want to lose my autonomy. I don't want to lose... And so then you start pushing back and you start saying, no, 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 this isn't right. And you you start twisting and manipulating the scriptures even for your gain. There's a problem there. There's a problem there. And we live in a world today that, you know, with the internet, there's a lot of blessings and there also comes a lot of hardships, isn't there? There's a lot of great resources that we can do. A lot of great things you can look up to help you understand this better. But it also comes with the availability of taking uh, Google and going and saying, what's the Bible say about this? And it'll give you a verse on its own. And people will take a verse and manipulate that verse out of the context of the Word of God to say whatever it is that they want it to say. We need to be careful to know the Word of God in its context Evaluate it, fact check it, but don't deny Christ. This is why as Jesus was talking to them, if you remember from earlier in John chapter 8, he says, I'm going away and you'll seek me and you will die in your sin. You will die in your sin. What a huge indictment on these people. You will die in your sin. You will die in the sin of rejecting the Messiah. You will seek me because I'm the Messiah, but you won't find me because you're going to look in all the wrong places. You have rejected the truth. And this is why at the end of this passage, the Pharisees who were hearing him when Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Verse 40, some of them said, so are we also blind? you got to imagine they're trying to trap Jesus here, trap him in saying, yeah, you're blind. And Jesus concludes it with saying, your guilt remains. Because you say you can see, that's all too revealing your guilt remains. For these people who are going to reject Jesus altogether. So as we walk through this, I think as we keep that deeper meaning in mind, it's not just about saying, hey, go look for the blind person and and heal them. Give them their physical sight. 
But remember, I think it's the teaching moment for the disciples of what it is that the light of the world comes to do. On one hand, the light of the world will open the eyes of those who are spiritually blind to see the truth, to see and understand who he is. On the other hand, the light of the world may blind people all the more. So I think it's appropriate to just encourage all of us, and I even challenged myself this week, to take stock of where I'm at. To take stock of where you at. Spiritually speaking, which person are you? The person who was blind, recognized your blindness, had sight given to you. The person who's curious, seeking out the truth, but hesitant. Or the person who's fearful to take a public and bold stand on it, or maybe reject it altogether. What's the condition of your heart? And take time before God to ask that question because it's a question and quite honestly it is a caution that's really worth considering. Because if we look at the end of this passage, Jesus is coming back to that deeper meaning. It's not just the physical, it's the spiritual that's at stake here. For judgment I came into the world. And uh, Bill, I, I loved it this morning. You said, hey, we're all so familiar with John 3, 16, but what about 17 and 18, right? So true. So true, because we take 16 and even 17, and we say, look, Jesus didn't come for any condemnation, but he also does. And so when he says something like this, for judgment I came into the world, we, we look at verse John 3, 16 and 17 and say, how, how does that mesh with Jesus coming for judgment? But we fail to understand it with verse 18. For judgment I come into the world, so that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. In other words, he's coming for the spiritually humble, those who do not see, who are blind, to give them sight. But those who are proud and boastful in their religious walk, those who think they've got it all together, he says, it's a different story for you. I've come to reveal your blindness in all that it is. And so we wrestle with these things. And I love D.A. Carson. His commentary has been great on this uh, gospel. And he quotes Biltman in, in his commentary. He says that this is the paradox of Revelation. That in order to bring grace, it must also give offense. And so can turn to judgment. In order to be grace, it must uncover sin. And so he who resists this binds himself to his sin. And so through the revelation, sin for the first time becomes definitive. I could not word that better myself. Because the light of the world has come, it, it makes sin definitive. A done deal based on your receiving or rejecting Christ. So D.A. Carson goes on in his own notes and he says that Jesus did not come to a world of sinners aware of their need and eager to be rid of their sin. Wow. Even those who entirely rely on genuine but inadequate light, a.k.a., he says, the Old Testament revelation, may prove too arrogant to admit the depth of their blindness. The brilliant shining of the true light only blinds them further. Their guilt remains. We live in a day and age where people, humanity is defined as being generally good. He's a good person. I'm a good person. And people may rely more on their own good works than allowing what God has said in his word to reveal the truth about the condition of our hearts. Who can trust his heart? Heart's deceitful and wicked. Could it be that your own heart is the first thing that will deceive you. This warning or this caution then is for those who are proud in themselves. Who look to say, hey, give myself a pat on the back because look at all that I'm doing. 
Look at all that I have done. There's a difference between that and saying, man, look at what Christ has done in me. I was blind. And I didn't open my own eyes. He opened them. And the life I now live is Christ in me, not me doing it. It is the power of Christ in me. It is not for our own gain. This man had no reason to boast. At the end of the day, he didn't come and as he's talking with Jesus, be like, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, I went to the pool of Siloam. I washed. Look what I did. He responded to what Jesus called him to do, but he gave the glory to God. He could have washed in the pool of Siloam all day long. It was Jesus who opened his eyes. In himself, no reason to boast. You and I today are in the same place. And as I look at a, a church of people who are walking with God, I, I want to caution us to, to slow down and not become prideful in and of ourselves, but to really consider where we are at. so that we don't become like those who are religiously proud. But we keep humility, and as we do so, we keep the perspective and eyes on Christ. To Him be the glory. So I want to close with just a couple points real quick of application. What do we do with this? How am I supposed to make sense of this when I go home today and walk with Christ? Number one, recognize that your perceptions are prone to faultiness. Your perceptions are prone to faultiness like I mentioned earlier, it was not just the Pharisees who asked the wrong questions, but it was the disciples as well. Think about it. The people who've been with Jesus rubbing shoulders with him. Bill, again, we're talking about thinking through where they are at in their walk with Christ at this point. How much time they have spent with Jesus. What they have seen him do. Heard him say. And they still ask. And they're looking outward, right? Look at this man. Who sinned? Him or his parents? I get it. How could they have known that Jesus was going to heal this man? How could they have known that this man was born blind so that the works of God may be revealed in him? Your perceptions are prone to faultiness because we don't always get the bigger picture. So submit yourself to God and trust that he is at work. That just because you perceive something one way does not always mean that that's the whole of the situation. That that's all of what God is going to do. Your perceptions are prone to faultiness. Secondly, recognize that your pride can paralyze your faith. That's why I say keep things humble. Keep the right perspective. Remember that you were blind and it wasn't you who gave yourself sight. Christ gave you sight. It is the power of God at work in you now. Stay humble. Keep that in perspective in your life because your pride can paralyze your faith. Because uh, as a believer, if you become prideful and of yourself, it will lead to you thinking, I don't really need Jesus on a daily basis. I don't need the power of the Spirit. I don't need to rely on the Spirit of God to live out the Christian faith. I've got this. And so then you don't walk by faith. You walk by your own strength. You walk in pride. Pride can paralyze your faith. But when we remain humble... When we keep things in proper perspective, then we have an opportunity to look and see with accuracy. It is God at work in me. I need Him daily. Lord, I need you every hour. And so then we walk by faith day in and day out. My pride can paralyze my faith. Third, my perspective will produce focus. In the scope of eternity... We don't really have a whole lot of time here. Jesus, uh, talking with his disciples at the very beginning, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Your perspective will produce focus. I remember doing an illustration with uh, the middle schoolers once where uh, we were talking a bit about this. And I brought in a really long rope and said, okay, this, this is your life. Right? The rope represents your life. But then that rope seems to get smaller and smaller. And we have boiled it down that, okay, what's your life? 80 years? 
90 years? Call it 100 for easy math. 100 years looks like a long shot to a guy who's 29. But 100 years doesn't look so long in view of 1,000, does it? 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. That lifespan looks smaller and smaller in view of time. What's that lifespan in view of eternity? Small. Your perspective will produce focus. I don't have an eternity right now to minister to you or to the people in our communities. We have a short time. How can we utilize the time to the glory of God? This doesn't always mean that you're taking every single second and being like, I'm getting out. I'm going. You become a madman. But are you stewarding the hours and the minutes and the seconds that God has given for his glory? How can I invest well with wisdom to take the dash of life that I have and to go and live it to the glory of God? Perspective will produce focus. I think Jesus, again, guys, teaching his disciples, I am the light of the world. This is what the light does. He comes to reveal and open eyes. But for some, they'll be blinded by it. So live in view of the deeper meaning of this miracle. The deeper meaning of what Jesus is teaching his disciples. Live a life with focus in all humility. Continually going back to God and his word for the proper perspective and perception of who you are and what he's doing. That changes the way you live Monday morning and Wednesday afternoon and everything in between.